Hello, my name is Eric Stephen, and I am one of the pastors at the Village Church. The following podcast is a ministry of the Village Church. We hope that it inspires you, that it draws you closer to Jesus, and it opens your eyes to the possibilities of living in the kingdom. Enjoy, and God bless. It's coming to talk about hermeneutics. All right. Well, I've already uh, said good morning for the first time in my head before even getting up here because I'm usually at the morning. So good evening. Good to see everybody. Uh, I'd like to start out with a uh, with something I would do with my middle school uh, Bible classes. I used to have the privilege of teaching seventh and eighth grade middle school Bible class at a Christian school in California. Uh, can I have a volunteer? It could either be a middle schooler or someone who feels like uh, taking on the role. No, no, no. Not a voluntold. You're good? <laughs> Are you good? All right. Okay, so I want to I wanna make a bet with you that the Bible says there is no God. Take my bet? All right. So I just need your help. I'd like you to uh, please read. Uh, Psalm 14, verse 1. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, start at the seventh word. Would you just read us the seventh, eighth, and ninth word? Yeah, right there. Uh, starting at, not starting at to the choir, starting at the. So then we come down to right there. Go ahead. Oh, no, 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 no. Just right there. There is no God. Hey, hey. <laughs> No, that's all right. That's all right. So, uh, and you you knew what was coming, but I just that's that's how I like to. So, that's good. Thanks, man. But I like to like to use that to you know kind of wake them up a little bit, but also to point to the fact that sometimes reading is not as easy as just reading. Sometimes there's a little more to it. And so uh, another exercise, here's an all play. Um, oh, okay. Okay, so today's talk, uh, hermeneutics. How to read words from long ago for life today. And so Eisen and I just played, does the Bible really say... And here, here's another example. And so if everybody just on three, we can read this together. Okay, one, two, three. Wait, the, there's God is now here or is it God is nowhere or gob, gobsnop, uh, gobsmacking this morning. David Psalmist just pops out with... God, I snow here. <laughs> and, you know, interestingly, if we look at the, uh, if we look at the old, uh, the old uh, Greek writing, not on this slide, but if it were any older than that, they did not use punctuation or even spaces between the words. So it would actually be quite, quite easy, and there are actually biblical texts in the Greek and the Hebrew where commentators will argue about, no, no, I think, you, I think it's this word and then that word. No, I think this is God, I snow here. Um, so there's, uh, you know, this is, it, it really is an issue. And so let's, let's talk for a minute about Hermeneutics. Uh, let me. I rescrambled my slides because I destroyed a couple this morning. Um, that's yeah. So we'll we'll get to it in a minute. But uh, hermeneutics, just for the for the real quick definition, is just kind of the art and the science of understanding what the Bible's saying. That's it's just understanding what the Bible's saying. And there are a few different ways to slice it. And I'm going to just talk about kind of what are the big questions involved. 
And then next week, Michael's going to talk to us about inductive Bible study, which I imagine is going to be a strategy for us to encounter the Word and and grow in our understanding of it and learn how to put that in practice in our lives. Is that about where, where we're going next week, Michael? Yeah. What? <laughs> it is now. <laughs> put me on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> um, but... Uh, but the first, the first thing I'll have to mention is it takes some work. It's not simple and easy. Um, if, you know, I'll just say it, it's, it takes some doing. And so for that reason, what I'd like to do first is just share just a few passages or verses that tell us how much we have to gain by going into God's Word. As I was preparing, I uh, just did a real quick Google search and came up with one page, had 100 uh, Bible verses about what the Bible says about reading the Bible. And uh, I don't think it stopped at 100 because there aren't any more. I think it stopped at 100 because that's a nice round number. It was kind of the top 100. But what I'd like to do is just point to a few uh, passages that remind us why we need to learn to study the Bible, learn to understand the Bible. And the first, sorry for the small words, the first is that the, Bi- the Bible's words are useful. And we've just read this passage, and so I'll just focus in on verses 16 and 17. In verse 16, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so God's Word is useful. It empowers us, it trains us, it teaches us, we have more understanding, it rebukes us, it stops us when we're in the wrong direction, it corrects us, it turns us toward the right direction, and then it trains us. That's, that's a lot of good stuff. There's another thing that it does. It gives us hope. The Bible's words give us hope. In Romans chapter 15, Paul writes, for everything that was written in the past, and he was talking about the Old Testament then, was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. And so, <clears throat> God's Word gives us hope. Next, God's Word does something that... What would I say? The human mind, the human heart, is a really complicated thing. And so often, when we're dealing with someone else, we're not sure where they're coming from, and... Often, we don't even know what we ourselves are being driven by. Why did I react this way? And we have have ways to, say, in community or with trained and gifted counselors, we can get a lot of help starting to understand that. But there are some things that it's just not obvious, and it doesn't quickly come up. And yet, The one who knows us better than anyone else. The one who made us. His word will uncover what's in our hearts. The book of Hebrews tells us, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. And so God's Word can be like a light, as as the psalm says, a light to my path, but also a light that shines on the secrets of our hearts. And sometimes things that are still secret to us. And then there's another beautiful thing that God's Word does. And that is it empowers 
our community. Uh, it's one of the things that is uh, that I've come to appreciate so much being part of this community is the the blessing that I and I believe so many of us really receive from being in this community, from knowing and being known, from building one another up, having that experience of being able to bless and help someone else and being blessed and helped and built up by others. And in Colossians, Paul says this, he says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the message, or in Greek it's logos, which means word, let the word of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And so, God's Word is a way we interact. One thing that I've really appreciated, I recall in my, my three or four years here at the village, a few times when Sue has spoken up to remind us that when we're thinking about ways to interact with people, to minister to people, uh, ways to grow, that coming back to this touchstone of God's Word, continually reading and taking in God's Word, meditating on, memorizing, sharing God's Word. You know, sometimes we get this feeling that I want to go to the next level, the next thing. And sometimes we make the foolish mistake that, oh, yeah, 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 well, there's the Bible, but now I'm moving to the next. There is no next. <laughs> the, the, the only next is, yeah, I'm going deeper in. I'm going more fully saturated. And so, so <clears throat> the, uh, God's Word does so much to empower our community. Now, with that, what we're seeing also, though, is it's not something that's necessarily immediate. How many, how many people from the moment they became a Christian or wanted to become a Christian immediately understood the Bible? No problems, no question marks. It's all clear. It's, yeah, me either. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, uh, as I, when I trusted Christ, I... Uh, I'd been going to church for a while and thought I was a Christian. And then when I, when I came to a place of actually trusting Christ, I thought that, uh, thought that understanding the Bible was just the pastor's job. As a matter of fact, I thought, hmm, maybe I should like go to seminary or something because like the pastor seems to get to understand the Bible. And that's probably a cool thing. But for now, boy, whew, I don't get it. It's a bunch of beautiful words. It seems to touch on some beautiful truths, but I can't put it together. And it wasn't until I was at a church that, as we often do here at the village, taught through Scripture expositorily, going passage by passage and letting the shape of the passage determine the shape of the sermon and really seeing it in context and and sitting under a pastor who is very gifted, as we have here as well, of at taking these eternal truths and describing what it looks like in day-to-day -day life. And, but it didn't, it didn't come right away, and it took a lot of work. And so I'd like us to talk about the process today. And uh, as if you uh, saw, oh, hermeneutics, good, I've always wanted to to know how to hermeneutic. Yeah, Jim, teach me that today. Uh, it's, uh, I guess what I would say is it's going to take more than my 25 minutes. Have you got, I don't know, an hour to, uh, have you got a lifetime? Uh, that's about what it's going to take. It's, it's a lifelong process. But what, what I think we've seen just in these few passages we've looked at is how worth it and how important that is. And what I would like to do is give a thumbnail sketch of some of the challenges that we face in trying to understand God's Word, some of the pitfalls, and what the process looks like 
as we grow in being able to understand God's word better and better. And so it's a human process where I am growing in my understanding. It's a historical process where I have a lot to learn about the culture and the background and even the languages from thousands of years ago that the Bible was written in and that the original authors were speaking to. And it's a divine process where as I'm doing that, we're not just learning calculus here or algebra or any other simple subject. What we're what we are doing is we're entering into a dialogue where God is speaking to us about reality through examples from the history of his his people and his dealing with his people. And so the first thing we need to realize, though, is we're all wearing glasses here today. Not all of our glasses are quite as fashionable as his. Okay, but we're all wearing glasses today. What do I mean by that? What I mean is when we come to the Bible, there is no one in this room who comes to it objectively. I would love to be able to believe that, yeah, when I look at the Bible, I'm, I'm completely objective. I don't take any of my own ideas. I just let the Bible speak to me. That's honestly not the way we work in life. Uh, the word hermeneutics, there are two, two areas where it's used. One is biblical hermeneutics, learning to understand what the Bible has to say. And then it's a, there's a division of philosophy called hermeneutics. And in that division of phil- philosophy, they took the right underst- understanding that we can't be completely objective And then they said, as a matter of fact, we're so unobjective, there's really nothing we can understand. And really, an author can't reliably say anything to us. And really, once he's written the words, he doesn't even matter or what he meant because the words are there and they just come to life. And there are all these people, most of them with French names and Derrida and Foucault and so on, who say all this stuff. And they're really despairing of having any meaning. And what, what we have to acknowledge is they're pointing to one thing that's correct. And that is that none of us comes to the Bible as a tabula rasa, as a blank piece of paper. Just here I am. I got, I'm starting from nothing. Just teach me. So everything you tell me will be true and good. No, every one of us, we have our experiences, our prejudices, the things that we thought and and a lot of the a lot of them are like my glasses right now, not completely clean. They've got little smudges and they've got wrinkles. And that might me, make me say, oh, no, well, then how can I ever come to understand God's word? But the good news is in a in a process a little less frustrating than the optometrist saying, is this better or this? This one or this? And I can never choose. I'm always like, oh, I don't know. This one's clear. That one's smaller. I don't know. Um, but there's a process. And so here's the graphic I, could, I erased uh, this morning by mistake. But it's called the hermeneutical spiral. And what happens is I start out with my pre-understandings. Okay, I start out with what I think God might be like. And that'll be affected by what I saw on TV, heard on the radio, heard from my parents. It'll be affected by my own relationship with my parents in many important developmental ways. And that's my starting place. And then I read the Bible starting with those assumptions. But if I can do it with some humility and then with God's grace, God will use his word to start cleaning up my assumptions. And then the next time I look at the Bible, I've cleared up some of my wrong ideas, maybe come up with a couple new ones, but then God fixes more of the things that are, that are mistaken in me. And, then there, and it's just a continual process, and so that's why it's drawn as a spiral there. 
And so I am, I'm grateful that that is the process we're entering into. And so <clears throat> with that, it's a lifelong process. Now, the other thing that I mentioned, though, is that, <clears throat> that as we read the Bible, it's not just a very simple bullet point uh, what would I say, like, you know, handbook or manual to human life. And instead, it's written by human authors. And so, so there's, there's a way we need to go into the Bible. So the goal of hermeneutics is to arrive at the meaning of the text that the biblical writers or editors intended their readers to understand. So the first thing we need to do is we, we need to kind of have a, a starting point. When I, uh, when I took my first course on, uh, it was my first semester in seminary, and I took the course hermeneutics. And the first assignment, he had us read different commentators throughout the history of the church. Not kooky guys like well-known, well-respected commentators like Augustine and John Calvin and, and Martin Luther, what they had to say about a very well-known parable, the, uh, the Good Samaritan. And what I was seeing was, one was saying, well, the animal, the donkey or whatever that he used to carry the, uh, the injured person, well, that represents Christ. And the innkeeper represents Paul. And somebody else said, no, no, no. And, and said, no, no, this person represents Christ. This person represents the Jews. And everybody had their own view on it. And so I start thinking, hmm, well, then where do we start? And one of the things that I'm really grateful for about God's revelation is that he rooted it in history. And so he didn't write a, a word or a psalm here and I'm reading it and it doesn't make sense. No, 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 because this one was written for Jacob. And Jacob's reading one. He's like, no, 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 that one's for Jim. And it's not making sense to either of us. Or something where, oh, yeah, well, this one makes sense to Americans. This one, that, this one was written for Asians, and this one for South Americans, and this one for Africans. That's not how he wrote. What he did do was he inspired about 40 different people spread out over thousands of years, all in one broad part of the world, mostly in one among one people, the, the Jews. And, and over those centuries, he had them speak to their situation. And so what we can do as we enter this process is know confidently that God was inspiring these authors and editors, these writers, in their specific context. So I don't have to wonder, hmm, well, was he saying this about America? Or was he talking about Russia or China? We can see, oh, he was talking about Europe. Or not Europe. Sorry, he was talking. It could have been, it could have been, you know, if we're talking about Paul going to Rome or something, but he was talking about Israel. He was talking about the people in the early church during that early time of the, or that time of the Roman Empire. And so we can, what we do is we look at what he was saying in that time and period, and we ask, what is the eternal truth it's pointing to? And from that eternal truth, we go on to ask, how will we apply that in our lives and the lives of our community and the people around us? So what, we start with what was the main point for the audience then? And what are, what are the things that are always going to be true from that? 
And how do we live that out today? Uh, my professor called it an hourglass. It's kind of like an hourglass on its side where we try and get to that focus of what's the thing that's really true. And there isn't a scientific formula for it. But as we'll talk about, we, we aren't without help either. Now, there's another thing that, that we want to look at, and that is the role of, like, for example, if we're looking at God is now here, and I look at those two letters, N-O, and I'd say, well, N-O, okay, uh, I guess that's no, like for nowhere. Or I could say, oh, wait, no, 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 maybe it's now for God right now. God is now here. Or I could say, well, maybe that's snow. God, I snow here. Thank you, David. Um, but but the, this look of these concentric circles I find really helpful. And so if we start with a target text, then what we do is first maybe I'm looking at a word, but that word only makes sense if it's in a sentence. I don't know about you guys. Do you have uh, Siri read you uh, articles and stuff sometimes? I do that. And like the word uh, when it's like this was read, she'll say this was read. Or, you know, if uh, it was this was made out of the metal lead, she'll say this was made out of the metal lead, you know, and just because Siri doesn't always know the right context. So a word only makes sense as it's part of a sentence. And that sentence doesn't only stand by itself like there is no God. No, that stands in a paragraph. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Okay? And then that fits an entire, if I, even before I go to the entire book, that goes to what the psalmist was writing in Psalm 14 about the, about the fools and about uh, the, the different paths people can walk. And then that's part of the entire book of Psalms where we see this whole worship book for God's people. And that also touches on something that we don't have here as clearly stated on this, but the issue of genre. So there are different kinds of writing. You know, the texts I get from Hannah have very few English words, you know, LOL and this and that, you know, LMK and, you know, all this. And that's appropriate to that genre of communication. Okay, and then we'll have others where it's an academic thing. And in the Bible, we have poems, we have history, we have parables, we have law where these regulations are given. We have historical like annals, like records, like chronicles, where it's just this many people and they live from this river to that line. And, and then we also have the Gospels, where it's a biography written to explain the good news of the life of Christ and the victories of Christ. And then we even have, a, we have prophetic writings where there are visions, promises, and threats about what might happen, and all of them calling us back to the covenant. And then we even have apocalyptic, where these crazy images are used to display divine truths. And so with all of these different, different types of genres, that's going to affect what's happening. And so... You, you look at, well, what's it doing in the paragraph? Well, what's it, how's this function in the whole book? How's this function in all the stuff, say, that Paul wrote? Well, how's this fit in the New Testament, what God was doing in the New Testament? Well, how's it fit in the whole Bible? And for that matter, what does it mean that somebody's saying it in that part of the world? Because their culture and their assumptions are different from ours. And what was going on in their history right then, you know, and the cultural background and all of these things. I'm not going to be able to tell you about the thousands of years of biblical history during a during one evening's talk. But 
what I am saying is that as we learn this, as we get more clear on this background, a lot of things that weren't clear will become more clear. So this is one of the fences we need to leap. Um, there, there are a couple of others. Um, the, uh, uh, an important part is coming back to this question of who is this passage talking to? And sometimes what we'll do is assume it's always about me. It's always about us. How many people have heard, uh, and forgive me, I'm going to guess wrong if I try and say the exact verse. I think it's in Second Chronicles 9, 6, 6, 9. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and seek me, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. I think I skipped a couple words too. But that beautiful promise, how many people have like heard that promise quoted like for the day of prayer or see you at the poll? A few of us. How many people have heard that applied to America? America, we need to turn back to Jesus and here's the promise. Was he speaking to America in, I don't know what it would have been, 600 B.C.? Maybe we're closer to 400 or 500 B.C. He might not have been just saying that to them just so that it would be ready and waiting for us. And so one, one thing you could do is you could just say, hmm, you know, Jim talked to me about hermeneutics and you better put that promise away. You know, just rip that out of your Bible promise book because that one's not for us. That was just for Israel. And not so fast. I look at it this way. Um, so here we've got a check. Do not present again. Fraud. So it looks like somebody tried to write the wrong name maybe on this check. Uh, I had something like this happen to me. I uh, I had someone uh, give a check as a gift to the ministry I was working with. And I was really appreciated it. Got back home. I'd been traveling. I got back home and I forgot to cash the check. And six or seven months later, I'm going through some stuff and I'm like, oh, and so there is this check from this brother in Christ who wanted to support our ministry and not valid after 180 days. And so you know what I did, right? Well, yeah, May looks a lot like March, doesn't it? Or March or May. No, I didn't do that. Um, I was tempted to. <laughs> <laughs> I was tempted to, but that's not the right way to do things, and it wouldn't have been respectful to my friend either. And so what I did do was I got on the phone, and I said, Dewey, yeah, this is Jim. I am so embarrassed. You remember that check you wrote? I totally forgot to cash it. Would you mind writing me another check? Now, at that point, do I have, does my check hold anything over him? Is like, you promised, you gave me a check. No. But he said, well, of course. I mean, the reason I wrote that check was because I wanted to support, support what you're doing. Of course, yeah, I'll put it in the mail tomorrow. Well, it turns out that the one who wrote that check about if my people, which are called by my name, I think he still loves and cares for us too. Now, whether it can be broadly applied to a, a secular nation in the 20th, 20th or 21st century, that's another question. But can God's people call on him and say, yeah, the same God who loved Israel like that 
He loves us like that. But it's not, I, I think some of what I did in my early days studying the Bible was I kind of looked, looked at it like from a Harry Potter worldview. You know, if you get the words just right, then these magic spells work for you. I, I think that's really a lot of what I did. I saw it that way. I also saw it as kind of this, like, okay, I love solving like things like crossword puzzles. And so it was kind of like this secret puzzle, you know, where you have to figure out what this word means. And once you do that, you're unlocking the magic. And what I missed was the process that God wants us to be in. And that's that's what I'd like us to uh, to kind of as we're as we're closing up, what I'd like to look at. The first first thing I'll note is, as we said, studying requires, but it also rewards hard work. Paul talking to Timothy says, "Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into this." Notice he doesn't say, "Reflect on what I'm saying, and it's up to you, buddy. Figure this out." Nor does he say, you know, the Lord will explain this to you, so, you know, don't even worry about it. It'll happen. No, he, he says, reflect on what I'm saying. You do the work and do the thinking because God is going to help you and give you more and more understanding in this. And so it requires hard work. It rewards hard work. It needs prayer, of course. And so I think of Psalm 119, verse 18. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. And then the one other thing that happens as we're trying to understand something that's been written and it's kind of hard to understand, one of the things we most wish we could do is know a little more about what was happening when it was being written. You know, there are still arguments going on uh, about what did the original framers of the Constitution mean when they said this or when they wrote that. And there are all these questions about it. And everybody's, everybody's very happy to say, oh, I know what they meant. They meant exactly what I want it to mean. <laughs> right? And... And so I thought of an, ex an example that's happened uh, on, on a couple of my good days. I've written poems for Tessie. And I, when I'm writing poems, you know, if it rhymes, I use it. And if it's, if it's a word that isn't as commonly used, but I mean, look, I got a sonnet going here. Come on. And so Tessie calls me over and says, Jim, wh what does this mean? Well, it's pretty handy if you've got the author available and you can say, what does this mean? Well, it turns out that what we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. Now, this process is not automatic. Oh, I wish it were. Lord, what's that mean? Ka ding Oh, thanks, Father. And on with life. No, often we'll wrestle with some of these questions for long periods of our lives. But we have the Spirit of God. The very Spirit who inspired Paul to write these words. Or Jesus as he spoke these words, or Matthew as he recorded what Jesus had said, or Moses, or David, or any of the prophets or historians who are anonymous to us. The very God, the very Holy Spirit, who was in them, inspiring them, moving them, is the same one who is in us as we are reading. And it doesn't mean that the light will go on. Sometimes it will. But what it does mean is that 
He's inviting us into a process of knowing Him through this. I, uh, I've never been a, you know, as I said, on a few good days, I've written Tessie some poems. But, you know, I've known some people who just kept up these wonderful uh, writing uh, relationships, like with their fiancés when they were separated, and how it just deepened their relationships. And it's just a beautiful thing. Well, the Bible, my friends, it's, you know, kind of corny, kind of hackneyed, but still very true. The Bible is God's love letter to you and me. And like any good literature, anything that was really thoughtfully written, it's, it's got some things that aren't clear immediately. Where it takes some extra reading. It takes some studying, some understanding the background. But it's so, so worth it. So, that's, that's what I have to share. I welcome any questions. So in the beginning, you were talking about our own misunderstandings or our own pre preconceived notions about what this passage may mean. Yeah. That's why I really enjoy like our Bible study, because I will bring up the passage and then other people will bring in their insights into that passage that I never would have thought of. So it's, it's much safer when you're talking with other Christians about a passage because you get more insight that way. And in the same way, when I'm doing studies, I go on the internet. Oh, there's so much out there. <laughs> it takes a lot of work to pick and choose, but there are things, insights in cultural things that I would never know without studying, you know, finding these resources outside the Bible mm -hmm. about the cultural and, yeah, things like that about the Jewish people. And I think the Jews have a lot of insight that aren't freely sharing with us Christians. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, it's so true. I think one, one mistake someone can make is if they're studying the Bible, especially if they're, say, going to be speaking or sharing, they just go right to the research and they just immediately start reading commentaries and, or listening to sermons online or whatever. And... And they don't have that process of it working through themselves. <clears throat> but the other one is where someone says, well, I'm not going to commentaries. I'm just doing the reading myself, just me and the Bible. And it often comes from a really good place. They want to have that relationship with God. They want to interact directly with God. But they're inadvertently stumbling into some pride where they're kind of saying, I don't need any of the things that God has shared with all the people who have gone before me. And, just, you know, so just like you're saying, you know, <clears throat> what what insights would a Jewish would a Jewish commentator have on a passage and what insights, what wisdom will God have shared with this author or this pastor or these brothers and sisters in my living room as we study together. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. So your yeah. Uh, analogy of the love letter reminded me of a passage uh, that Soren Kierkegaard wrote about basically using the same analogy, where it's like it's a, a love letter written in a different language. And so as the receiver of the letter um, were to, you know, if we were to read it and spend all of our time... Um, trying to figure out what it said without actually doing what it asked us to do, that would be disappointing to the person who wrote us the letter. Um, so in the same way, like, we have to also act on the things in the letter that we do understand um, mm. and not just spend our time trying to understand everything. So I guess what advice do you have for striking the balance between doing what is clear and trying to understand what is not clear? Uh, probably just what you said. <laughs> yeah, I think um, <clears throat> one thing I learned early in my Christian walk was that God is slower to answer hypothetical questions. 
We know that James, uh, there was a person I met on a short-term mission trip, and he, he had taken a Christian name, and his name was Dewar, which is a really awkward English name, but he took it from James, where James says, do not be merely hearers of the word, but doers also. Or does he say, do not be merely hearers of the word deceiving yourselves, but be doers of the word also, right? And, and so I, I think just what you're pointing to is very true and important, that from the light we have, that's enough for us to start walking. And a lot of things I'm not going to see until I get up to that, get further along. And so if I'm reading the Bible and I have a hunch that it's telling me I, I'm supposed to, I don't know, sell everything I own and uh, go hitchhiking naked to Russia, I, I really want to be clear on that before I take action. But if I am reading the Bible and I'm not sure all of what it means, but something is telling me I need to make things right with somebody or I need to trust God more or something like that, well, let's grab onto that and walk in it. Uh, the other thing, uh, I was in a conversation after, my, after uh, speaking this morning, and one of the things that... I had forgotten to share this morning was, you know, God has done a lot of gracious stuff in people's lives and among his people through, or I'd say, despite some pretty sketchy exegesis. There are a lot of times that I, and I'm sure you and many people, have taken a Bible verse out of context and misunderstood it. We were coming from a good place. We were trying to understand. And we took some steps and we went back years later and we learned some more about hermeneutics and said, oh, I was wrong on that. But we were in this process of understanding God's word and walking in what we did understand. And I think God is very happy to forgive us our missteps and our mistakes as we're seeking him through his word. So I, I think your question uh, answered itself really well, but I really appreciate your asking it. Thank you. My thoughts as I listen to this, by the way, I think this has been really cool stuff that you gave us. Thank you for doing this. It's really Thanks. been great. As as I contemplate looking at the difficulty of the task of trying to understand the Bible, I guess from my point of view, uh, it, the very thing that makes it difficult is also what it makes it valuable. And there are two reasons for that. One is if you have a math textbook or a cookbook or you know something that tells you how to do that, and it can be really involved, you know. But once you've read it. As long as you remember it, you don't need to read it again because it only has one meaning. So you're done, mm. right? I don't need to go back and read algebra again because I got it the first time, right? I can still do it. Uh, but with poetry or great literature, there are layers upon layers of meaning and context and interaction between the words and the sounds and the characters and their motivation and the situation that lend a richness to meaning. That's why poetry is so wonderful, and yet for some of us is more difficult because it's not here. You read it and you understand it. It has, it says a lot. There's a lot going on in between the words, and so that's when you read the Bible. God is the most brilliant author in the history, obviously, and so He has subtlety and ability to instill those things in there. Uh, that 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 you know we we keep digging for and and the other thing is it's called the word of God right well God is infinite in knowledge infinite in power He knows everything He know not only knows how many hairs are on my head but 
which is different than it was a couple of days ago. Everybody knows how many hairs there were on every single person throughout the history, you know? He, he knows everything. He knows everything about science. He knows everything about the heart. He knows about our sins. He knows about everything. And so, and he is, his plans are so complex and so great that we don't, we can't understand all of them because if we were, we'd be God. And so what we're trying to delve into is something that is so rich and it really goes back to trust. You know, we, we, we try to understand. James said, if any man lacks wisdom, let he ask of God, you know. Uh, but, and so I put that verse to myself all the time as I go back and try to understand these things. But the truth of the matter is, is I'm not God and I have to trust him. If I'm a two-year-old, I trust in my parents. I don't understand all the issues they have to go through in order to put food on the table. But I just figure they're going to because, you know, they're them. And so I guess I'd like to put out that as we try to understand this, which is incredibly valuable to try to understand God's word, with the difficulty also comes these wonderful promises of infinite compassion, infinite plans, infinite thought, infinite uh, uh, subtlety that we just are always peeling back the layer of the, engine, of the onion and learning more and more. So that's, to me... The fact that it's difficult also means that it is it's incredibly valuable. Thanks, Larry. Yeah, it's a good word. I think there's also uh, needs to be an understanding that the the Bible is a way of of God offering us relationship, and that that what we say in relationship shifts over time in terms mm -hmm. of its meaning. When I told Keith that I loved him at 21, it didn't mean the same thing as when I tell him I love him now, you know, after 34 years, because what we've experienced together and the ways that... Um, the ways that I've failed him or that he's failed me or like the things that he loves me despite um, like those develop more meaning over time. So in addition to the, the Bible being a text that has meaning, it also represents the relationship that God offers us and that meaning in terms of our personal experience, shifts over time. And a big part of that is it's, it deepens. You are you have so much more capacity to understand and receive from Keith, capacity to to give, and yeah, your your bigger vessels, deeper. Yeah, thank you, Julie. Are we good? All right, thank you, everyone. Could I pray for us? Father, we, there's so much, and it's so rich in your word, so many promises about what you offer to us as we seek you, both in how you make it possible for us to seek you and in how you, you joy in rewarding those who seek you. And so, Lord, I, I want to ask tonight that would, we would be like the one in, in Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. Thank you, Lord, that you know the way of the righteous, and thank you for inviting us to know you through your word. Give us grace to, to take you up on that each day. In Jesus' name.